Hey, hello everyone. Hope that we're all here. Time to get started. Nice to be with you here this evening. My name is Natalie Olson and I'm an Education and Engagement Specialist with Alberta Environment and Parks. I'll be your facilitator this evening. Very glad to be with you here tonight for the Northwest Region Fisheries Management Update webinar. I'd like to begin by uh, respectfully acknowledging that I'm calling in from Treaty 6 territory, but we're gathering together online here from across the province, across the treaties 4, 6, 7, 8, and 10, and we'll be covering topics from across the territories and homelands of many Indigenous peoples whose histories, language, and cultures continue to influence our communities today. And I make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and in gratitude for everyone who has come before us and who has lived in and cared for these lands for uh, many generations. Tonight, we have uh, a special treat for you, having a numerous panel of um, very intelligent and specialized biologists who will be presenting to you uh, on topics of the Northwest region. I will provide a short uh, welcome and introduction as we get started here, and then I'll pass off the presentation for our biologists. We'll have um, about an hour for question and answer towards the end here before we close the meeting at 8.30. We do want to keep this webinar interactive and hope that you'll have lots of questions for us along the way. We'll be using the Q&A box that you'll be able to find on your screen. If you're on the computer, it might be across the bottom bar. If you're on your tablet or cell phone, it might be on the side or within the app. But you'll find that question and answer tool and we'll be using that um, to ask the questions. So as we go along, you're welcome to submit questions at any time. And you can also upvote for the questions that you'd really like to see answered. We may not have time to get through all of the questions tonight, so we will prioritize the questions that have the most votes and are highest on the list. You'll be able to see that um, in the Q&A box, you can uh, change if you want to see the questions that are most recent or most upvoted. So you can adjust that at any time to see the questions and use that little thumb in order to upvote them. I'll remind you of that as we get in towards the question and answer period, but just know that you can ask those questions anytime. If you have any inappropriate language or comments in those questions, we'll have to delete them, but I don't expect that to be a problem. If there's a few questions that we might be able to group, we will try to do that just so we can try to address more questions in our limited time here tonight. We also have a few pre-submitted questions that we'll be answering that were uh, submitted to us during your Zoom registration time. So I'll turn it over to our panelists here. I just wanted to introduce, I'll invite everyone to give us a wave as we go through. Your presenters tonight will be Adrian Menke, uh, Miles Brown, and Mike Blackburn. We also have on the panel here to share some of their expertise, uh, Kate on Wilcox, Chris Briggs, Brian Cox, Brian Green, and Kevin Stalker. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Also on the team, our engagement education specialists, myself, uh, Janine Higgins and Catherine Medinsky are here providing some technical support and ensuring that all of your questions are answered to the best of our ability. So you might not see them later on. Um, they'll be working away in the background. With that, I'll invite our panelists to turn your videos off and we can hand it over to Adrian for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie, and welcome all. This is going to be a special night. Thank you for sharing the next couple of hours with us. Uh, today, we thought we'd share some updates, some interesting pieces of work that we've done here in the Northwest region over the last year. Um, and we'll talk about regional lake assessments. We picked a few of our favorites. Walleye stalking, what we've done in the Northwest to contribute to the provincial initiative and what we in the Northwest do to contribute to native trout recovery. We have a couple of points to discuss. One is the Muskeg Watershed Assessment, 
And number two would be the McLeod River Assessment. I'll start us off with a regional lake assessment on Smoke Lake. To put us in the spot, Smoke Lake is just southwest of Fox Creek off of Highway 43. This past year, we were able to get up to two, two really exciting things. One was a spring trap net, and two was a fall index netting. And we were combining those two pieces to do a population estimate. We were success, successful at marking just about 5,200 walleye and releasing them back into the lake and following up with the fall index netting for the recap. This is to support the evaluation of recovery. And just to remind us all, in 2016, Smoke Lake was deemed high risk after three consecutive sampling events showed a decline in walleye density. So in 2018, we put to catch and release regulation in the lake to allow it to recover. And a have to report we've had a couple of monitoring events showing continued signs of improvement. In 2020, we raised up to a moderate risk category. And this past season in 2022, we're out in the low risk category for walleye density. There's signals of recovery. So before I get started, I'd like to lay out what the graph is on the right. These are length distributions of fish. There is four time slices monitoring data, 2013, 16, 20, and 22. On the top, you see some cartoon characters. And from the left, you have babies. So anything on the left side of these graphs are small, young fish. And all the way over to the right side, you have the old folks and everything in between. I overlaid some yellow bars just to show us uh, to anchor our eye. And those yellow bars are overlaid across tag categories. So you see the blue vertical bar is class C, class B, and class A. If we look in 2016 in the class C tags, we see a pretty good reduction of fish. Those each individual black bar is the number of fish in that size category. So those bars are really starting to be shrunk. When we look in 2020, we see that we filled in that section. We filled in the number of fish in the class C tags. So in 2021, we went out to the public of Alberta and asked them what they would like to do. Offered them, we could give you a small bit of harvest at this point in time, or we could allow recovery to continue and those fish grow into this larger size category. The participants of that survey decided that they thought it was best to allow them to grow in and fill in a little bit of that class B, the larger size category. And in 2022, happy to report that we seem to have done that. In overall, if you just look at both years, 2016, most of that red circle is empty. Those bars are quite short, but in 2022, we've seen a fill in of those fish. And on top of that, we've seen a very strong pulse of young fish outside the size categories coming. So what I expect in the, in the near future is increasing in angler success. And this data set, these analyses is fresh off the presses. I still have some homework to do to, to put together some regulation options. I hope to be back out and present this data next year so we could look at um, how to manage into the future. With that, I'd like to pass it over to my colleague, Miles Brown. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, I'm gonna take a few minutes uh, here, folks, to talk about Fawcett Lake. Uh, for folks that haven't been to Fawcett before, it's a 3,400 hectare lake uh, located about 45 minutes east of the town of Slave Lake uh, and just north of the community of Smith. Uh, next slide, Adrian. So the two main species I'm going to talk about in Fawcett Lake right now from our assessment work are northern pike and walleye. The first slide here, uh, I'm going to talk about northern pike for a little bit. So at, at this point in time, uh, northern pike are underneath a recovery objective. Uh, their current regulation in the 2022 fishing season was catch and release. Uh, we put catch and release on the fishery in 2020 uh, after the survey, the uh, survey in 2019 had indicated a decline from previous years. The graph you see on the left-hand side here, uh, each of the black bars that's there represents the average adult catch rate for pike in our index nets. Uh, and the uh, years along the x-axis, the bottom uh, 
axis of the graph there are the years in which we had those surveys. So if we just take a second and zoom back out from that, look at this through time, we understand that pike have kind of been bebopping around uh, in that low abundance, high to very high risk category for a, a period of time. Through that time, they've had a couple different regulations, all of them harvest regulations. We've had a few other management actions at Fawcett Lake through time where we were hoping to see positive returns in terms of fish abundance from those decisions. We hadn't. And so following that 2019 survey, conclusion was let's move to a recovery period, catch and release. Uh, and then as we saw in 2022 here, three years later, uh, hopefully what is the start of a positive trend moving up, uh, adult abundance began to grow. The graph on the right side uh, of the slide here uh, it looks at what the size structure is of the pike that we caught in the survey. So folks are out at angling at Fawcett Lake. They are finding pike, which is great. Doesn't mean that they're not there. Just means that they're below the target that we would like to see them at in terms of being able to offer them for harvest opportunities, whether that's for sustainable harvest or a quality harvest. So there's uh, a, a cohort of fish that we see present there representing two to three year classes between 50 and 60 centimeters, but less fish uh, that are still present in that population over 60 with some signs of recruitment coming in. Our goal is to return Fawcett Lake back to uh, an abundance, middle of the road, moderate risk for sustainability, where it will afford that harvest opportunity again. And so when we complete our next survey uh, in two to three years, hopefully we'll have seen that abundance continue to climb. We'll have hung on to those fish as there's no harvest mortality uh, at this time. They should continue to recruit and grow older. And then with recruitment filling in, uh, our hope is that we will see uh, Northern Pike come back up and we'll be coming back to the public to talk about uh, regulation options for harvest. Next slide. Changing gear, so you know, pike uh, not uh, still underneath the recovery action, work to do there. Uh, walleye, different story. Uh, so walleye were underneath the recovery objective uh, for about 11 years. Uh, that began after the 2011 survey where we put SHL or what we call the TAG program in place. Uh, and through that time, we have seen sort of persistent but slow recovery and recruitment. Beneficially, uh, 11 years later, we now see uh, moderate to high abundance of adult and juvenile fish in Fawcett Lake. So the bar that runs across the top of the slide here represents those sustainability categories of our FSI or Fish Sustainability Index. You can see in 2019, the very first arrow on the left-hand side there, again, that adult population was sort of between the two categories of high risk and moderate risk, getting close to our target. We were able to hang on to uh, some of those uh, medium and large size fish from what Adrian showed us in his last slides, those class A and class B uh, sized fish, as well as having strong signals of recruitment moving into our uh, uh, juvenile and young adult fish. And overall, what that's done is we've now seen Fawcett Lake come up where our current abundance is, is kind of splitting the crosshair between moderate risk and low risk, which is really great. Next slide, please. So the graph on the left hand side similarly is just depicting the results that we got from the 2022 survey. The black circles along the bottom indicate the number of walleye in one of our sample nets that we would have caught within the survey. And the bell curve that you see simply tells us with it being that tight that we got a lot of confidence in the catch from this survey. The distribution of points was not that wide. And all of those points tend to be trending in that moderate to low risk uh, categories of the FSI. So this looks like a real signal of recovery. Similar to the slide we just saw, the graph on the right here, each of those black bars, again, indicates one of the surveys that we have completed through time while monitoring the recovery of this population. Uh, and post that regulation change, 2011, where we've used SHL as sort of a recovery tool, a way to hand out uh, some fish each year under a budget while at the same time looking for that population growth. We've seen that achieved now. And corresponding to that, 2023 will present uh, the highest number of tags we'll be able to allocate out across all three of those size categories, uh, about a 45% increase from the past uh, season. Next slide, Adrian. So what does that mean for the anglers that are at Fawcett Lake? The graph on the left-hand side here, similarly, is describing the size structure. So what would you see for fish in the population? The red line that's on these graphs basically just represents sort of a, a, an average population that would provide a sustainable harvest opportunity. The black line represents the data we see in Fawcett Lake. 
Uh, and so we have strong signals of those uh, medium and large size fish, strong signals of recruitment coming in. And that's reflected as well in the graph on the right hand side, which gives us an idea of what the sort of a cross section at this snapshot in time of what the age structure in this population looks like. And this would be something that we would view as quite sustainable. We've got fish that are in there up to about 22 years of age. Uh, so both a broad age and size structure. And as we progress uh, through time here, we're hopeful that we'll be able to come back to anglers and actually talk about other potential regulation options now, now that we've got this uh, capital in the bank for Wally and Fawcett Lake that may be uh, not SHL. Uh, we can describe sort of the trade-offs uh, in future seasons of uh, if we moved away from that to a different regulation type, what might that mean? Uh, so stay tuned, positive news for Wally and Fawcett Lake. Uh, with that, that's, that's going to bring uh, to a close the part of the presentation here where we're going to talk about uh, sort of updates from lake assessments. Uh, the next few slides are going to talk about the efforts of the staff in the Northwest region uh, to contribute to Alberta's walleye stocking program. Uh, so if folks uh, were able to attend the webinar that happened there last week, uh, our provincial update spoke a little bit about walleye stocking. Uh, we've got some great resources available on My Wild Alberta. Uh, and starting in 2020, uh, the province resurrected its uh, walleye stocking program. Uh, we right now that predominantly has included uh, egg takes at Lac St. Anne with stocking opportunities happening in southern Alberta in a lot of the reservoirs. The intention for the walleye stocking program is to provide some of those new walleye stocking, new fishing and harvest opportunities in appropriate water bodies across the province. Uh, our goal in the Northwest is to start to identify some of those places within the Athabasca watershed and the Peace uh, watersheds where we could potentially have stocked walleye opportunities uh, or stock in lakes that have uh, a stocked population already. So not stocking over top of native fish, but either bolstering stocked fisheries that we've created already or looking for new opportunities. The work that we completed as a region in 2022 was getting into some of the investigatory pieces to say, well, where can we identify a donor stock that ensures that as we are going to move fish around, we keep those uh, fish coming from within the watershed. Uh, we focused our efforts in the Athabasca drainage. We looked at one opportunity for a, an egg and gamete take from a tributary to Lesser Slave Lake called Strawberry Creek. We concluded Strawberry Creek was not going to be an effective place to regularly uh, access and take walleye eggs from. Uh, and so we also worked with our colleagues in northwestern Alberta or northeastern Alberta, pardon me, uh, to assess Rock Island Lake. Rock Island Lake is located north of the town of Athabasca. Uh, our goal there was to evaluate its potential to be a donor uh, source for walleye eggs and milt uh, in order to facilitate stocking for some lakes in the Athabasca drainage. Uh, the objectives we had there were to determine like what is the size of the spawning run, uh, are we going to encounter enough males and females to take enough uh, of those eggs for us to facilitate what our stocking needs were, uh, and to potentially evaluate new ways to do that, where in the past we've had very stationary large camps uh, with a lot of on-site work, and we wanted to see if we could trim that down and have more mobile uh, and sort of flexible approach that might enable us to move within the drainage in future seasons. Next slide. So we had very positive results from Rock Island Lake. Uh, utilizing similar traps to what Adrian had mentioned on Smoke Lake, uh, we put six traps into the, the lake for a period of six days, uh, testing different habitat types. We collected nearly a thousand walleye. Those were broken down between males and females. And from that, we were able to conclude that we can access enough eggs without negative consequence to Rock Island Lake to be able to meet some of our stocking targets in a few water bodies in the upper Athabasca watershed. Uh, we also concluded that our method for being uh, a little bit more mobile and taking those eggs in a different fashion uh, is, uh, has a high probability of success. And so that might have some really exciting uh, outcomes for us in the future for potentially moving between water bodies within a season. And so our hope here is now in future years, we'll be able to use Rock Island Lake as an egg donor uh, to look at stocking opportunities in the Athabasca watershed and in the Northwest region. And with that, I'm gonna close myself out and hand the microphone back over to my colleague, Adrian. Thank you, Miles. That was fantastic. Next, we'd like to discuss some of the efforts in the Northwest on native trout recovery. And this is predominantly focused within the east slopes of our portion of the region. In support of the Provincial Native Trout Recovery Initiative, the Northwest Region collects inventory data on priority watersheds. Tonight, we'd like to speak about a few. 
I'll lead us off with the Muskeg Watershed Assessment. This assessment was part of a, class, a standardized collection method where we went across the entire watershed and employed two techniques. One, backpack electrofishing, and two, some angling data. The objective of this program was to assess density and distribution of bull trout along with the density and distribution of competing non-native trout species. We were fortunate enough to be partnered with Insiniwich Winniwack Nation to help complete the sampling. Like I said, the first portion of the assessment was backpack electrofishing, which you can see here in the picture. We completed 35 electrofishing sites, and the map to the right, if you just focus your eyes on the black dots or X's, it'll give you an understanding of the distribution of those sites across the watershed. In total, we captured 439 sport fish species, which comprised of 60 bull trout, 126 rainbows, and 253 burk trout. And one thing I might add with this backpack electrofishing work, we're really sampling the small streams and tributaries to the big water. So what we see here is predominantly non-native fish species uh, making the majority of the catch. The bit of the opposite were true in our angling assessment. This is the technique we use to assess the larger water. That's a little bit harder to get some of our more traditional e-fishing uh, sampling platforms in. We were able to complete 20 main stem angling sites. And if I draw you back to the map, please just focus on the red X's or dots, gives you an idea of the distribution of sampling sites for this phase of the program. In total, we captured 111 sport fish, 78 of which were bull trout, 17 rainbow trout, and four brook trout. And you can see the reverse is true here, where in the, in the large river, our Alberta wolf, the bull trout, seems to be the predominant species, and the non-natives seem to be more isolated in the tributaries. Interesting observation. In general, we got ourselves uh, another standardized data set. I think this is number two for future trend analysis to be able to track these sport fish populations through time. We now understand the distribution of non-native species and competing species within the watershed. And we're gonna use this data to assess future potential recovery actions. Our goal is continued partnership to assess the recovery and also to identify habitat issues as we move forward. Now it's time for me to hand the microphone over to my colleague, Mike Blackburn, to lead us through the McLeod River Assessment. Thanks, Adrian. Okay, let's talk about the McLeod River. So similar to what Adrian discussed, uh, next slide, please, Adrian. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so similar to what Adrian discussed, Standardized assessments have also been completed in the McLeod River watershed over the recent years. And as many of you probably know, the McLeod River suffered a sizable fish kill in uh, July 2021. Uh, we experienced extremely high air temperatures combined with abnormal low flows, and this resulted in water temperatures that proved to be lethal to many fish. We received many public inquiries and concerns regarding floating fish in the McLeod River, most of which, which were mountain whitefish and some suckers. So tonight, I'm gonna to focus on the McLeod River main stem fish assessment and more specifically mountain whitefish. So the objective here would be uh, to complete, to compare the current catches, so after the summer kill uh, and to previous year catches before 20, the 2021 summer kill. So let's look at some of the results. The McLeod River watershed is assessed and managed as two sub watersheds. So we have the upper watershed and the lower watershed. I'll start with the upper McLeod, which is the river section from the headwaters of Cataman downstream to Highway 47, just southwest of Edson here. So on the screen is a graph showing fish size distribution and catch. Along the bottom of the graph is fish size in millimeters with fish getting larger as we move from left to right and the height of the colored bars indicate the number of fish in each size category. So the higher the bar, the more the fish in that size category. So when we compare the 1998 gray bars uh, to the 2006 red bars, 
we can see that the width and the height of the bars are quite similar, meaning similar sizes, numbers, amount whitefish per kilometer. So moving into the kill, uh, it seems like a fairly stable position or a uh, fairly stable populate population, sorry. Uh, but however, when we compare to, next slide please, uh, 2006 uh, to the two, 2022 bars, uh, after the kill, surprisingly, they are also quite similar. So all in all, we're, we're unable to detect the negative effect from the 21 summer kill in the upper McLeod section. What we can say is that the relative abundance of Mount Whitefish appear to have been hovering at a moderate to high risk state at the time of all of these assessments. So now let's look at the lower McLeod. So, sorry. Just catching up on my screen here. The Lower McLeod River section is uh, from Highway 47 to Southwest Meds, and, and it flows downstream uh, to White Court, where it flows into the Athabasca River. So, looking at the same graph, we can see that Mountain Whitefish data sets in 2013 and 2021, both prior to the kill, appear also to be similar in width and height of the bars. So, again, meaning similar sizes of fish and numbers of Mountain Whitefish uh, per kilometer. These data indicate actually a higher density or a high to moderate density of fishery, density fishery prior to the kill. Next slide, please. However, when compared to the 22 data, the blue bars, mount whitefish size distribution and densities or the width and height of these bars appear to have dropped dramatically. So what does this mean? Next slide, please. So although mount whitefish densities have uh, appeared to have dropped dramatically between 21 and 22, we were unable to complete half of the the assessment of the Lower McLeod last year uh, because of extremely low river flows. So because of this, we need to be cautious in our interpretations using that data set. So currently, uh, we there's no planned regulation changes for 2023. However, we plan to reassess the Lower McLeod and get a comprehensive assessment, and we'll use those data to inform future fisheries management actions in the McLeod River. And that's all I have for tonight. And back to Adrian. Thank you, Mike. That was great. Um, and now it's time for the summary. You were able to get a sneak peek into the Northwest region. We gave you some quick tidbits of work, interesting and fun and exciting work that we've done, uh, including regional lake assessments, our contribution to the walleye stocking program for the province, and also our contributions to the native trout recovery program. At this point in time, We'd really like to open up the floor to questions and I'll turn it back to Natalie and we'll take the, the rest of our time to, to speak to, to what you're interested in. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Miles. Thanks, Mike. Great presentations. I learned a lot, hoping our audience did too. And I would love to see some questions come into our Q&A with anything that you would all like to know about. Uh, in the meantime, we will take a few of the pre-submitted questions that we've received on the Zoom registration and, uh, and start with those. So the first question that I'm going to pose tonight comes from Mike, and he asked, when will barbless hooks become law? Thanks, Natalie. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump on this one. And, and just as I'm doing it, Natalie, um, I know we've had some new participants this evening, and I welcome those uh, new participants that, that joined us a little bit uh, after the start of the presentation. Uh, Natalie, I'm going to try to remember your words here, and I'm just going to ask folks that they can uh, navigate down to that Q&A bar uh, at the bottom of there and click that open and, and submit a question on there. And of course, if they see a question uh, that they'd like to see answered, that they can just hit the upvote uh, tab on that as well. So for any folks joining late. So um, so I'm not sure if uh, Mike's on the line here tonight, Natalie, so I'm going to thank him for that question for submitting it. Um, Mike, the, the question of barbless hooks is, uh, is, a, is a quite common one. Uh, we also understand that uh, the application of barbless hooks is something that a number of Albertan anglers or Albertans are interested in seeing implemented in some of our fisheries. Um, so, so Mike, what we anticipate doing over the next year here actually is engaging Albertans on that topic of, of barbless hooks, but maybe even expanding that to uh, other gear regulation types. So, um, you know, we, I, I could anticipate that that might be a focal area of our of our eastern slope and native trout fisheries. Mike, on that is certainly as a beginning, um, and and more information to come. So, 
I, I think at least in the interim, uh, I'd uh, encourage folks that would like to learn more about barbless hooks or other fish handling techniques. They can Google fish handling Alberta. Uh, our My Wild Alberta website will come up and we've got a, a great section on fish handling techniques. And for Mike and others to just stay tuned, uh, probably later this, this year in 2023, we look, uh, we look forward to it initiating uh, a discussion with Albertans on, on barbless hooks and other gear types. So uh, back to you, Nat. Thanks, Kata. Next question comes from Daryl. He's wondering what is happening at Walden Lake? Uh, thanks for your question, Daryl. Um, yeah, at Walden Lake, uh, as you may know, uh, last year we did do a presentation on uh, the results of the, uh, the survey of the lake, which found that uh, walleye were at a um, high risk uh, to sustainability. Uh, after consulting with the public, we decided to um, implement a special harvest license, SHL, uh, some limited numbers, uh, which would um, still allow the recovery to occur, but also uh, provide some harvest opportunity. Uh, and I, you can uh, refer back to actually to the, the webinars online if you kind of want to refresh with the details on that. Uh, Tags will continue to be used on that lake uh, for the next three to four years uh, for sure, at which time it will be reassessed. And then uh, we will hopefully see uh, some recovery like we've been presented there at uh, some of the lakes tonight. And we can uh, come back out and see what uh, some of the options are for um, regulation changes. Thanks, Chris. I had uh, two questions come in that I'm going to group because they're about Fawcett Lake from Miles and Greg. They The first question is, I live at Fawcett Lake and would like to know when pike fishery will be reopened. Pike numbers are high in all age classes. And the second question from Greg was, what is the timeline for changes to the walleye regulations for Fawcett Lake? And, and I can uh, answer that, Natalie, thank you. Uh, so thank you, uh, uh, another Miles out there for asking that question, as well as uh, Greg. Uh, so you saw a few slides about uh, both of those things here today. Uh, I'll take a minute to talk about the pike first. So we know that the pike are below uh, what we would evaluate as sort of a middle of the road adult abundance. Uh, I would certainly agree. We see uh, several year classes that are present there, the strongest ones being ages three, four, and five. Uh, so we know we've got some bench strength coming into that population. The uh, like moderate to large size adult year classes are again underneath what what we would look at to say uh, these are at a suitable level to consistently sustain harvest opportunities uh, from all the users that would be at Fawcett Lake. So uh, the timeline, it's difficult for me to say, you know, by this year, uh, we expect things to be on track. We've seen a positive change in abundance between 2019 and 2022. If we saw the same amount of growth between 2022 and our next survey, uh, which will be somewhere around 2024, 25, uh, that would be enough of a change for us to move that back to an open harvest opportunity. Uh, and similarly, that would mean that we've hung on to those year classes. We know we're there, they've matured, they've grown uh, with the reduced mortality. We should have them there present as those quality and trophy sized fish. Uh, not that those aren't there now, but just in lower numbers than we'd like to see. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, with respect to walleye, again, we've now seen uh, positive improvement, which is great. Tag allocations have gone up. Uh, so for this next year, this will be the highest number of uh, class A and class B. So those over 50 and 43 to 50 centimeter fish that we've been able to allocate at Fawcett Lake. Uh, we've also got a high number of class C's coming out. And for those folks that were able to attend the provincial webinar, uh, which if you haven't, I recommend you look at on our YouTube channel. Uh, there is some opportunity in the coming season to also access class C tags uh, as undersubscribes and hold them at the same time as another class of tags. So uh, more opportunity for each individual to have harvestable fish underneath the existing SHL system. So uh, as we complete the next assessment, hopefully we'll be able to uh, talk about new opportunities. So uh, hold fast and um, I expect to be speaking with you in a couple of years. Thanks, Miles. So those were our pre-submitted questions. Uh, we have a lot more questions coming in in the question and answer. That's great to see, keep them coming and uh, keep on upvoting for the ones that you'd really like to see answered as well. 
Uh, our next question here is going to come in from Andrew. He's asking, how long until Sturgeon, Snipe, and Slave Lake fish limits are re-evaluated to allow for pike catch limits and more walleye? All right, so I'm going to take that. Andrew, Andrew, thank you for that question. Yeah, that's a... That's an interesting question. In terms of like an exact timeline, I don't think I'd be able to give you the answer, but this is the benchmarks or the measuring sticks that we would use to start to consider when that time was right. And that is using our uh, standardized assessment method, which is fall index netting, and then interpreting our data as we presented it today through the fish sustainability index. So many of those pike populations right now in snipe and sturgeon, um, and, and Miles can help me with slave if, if we need. Um, what, what we're dealing with is very low densities, high risk populations, and they seem to be hovering around those, those high risk categories for a while. So we've implemented catch and release to allow those populations to rise. At this point in time, recovery is not quite where we're wanting it. So we would have to see those populations rise in density into that moderate risk category within the FSI. And then that point in time is where we deem there's some alla allocatable, some, some ability to harvest those fish without risk to long-term sustainability. The same would be with walleye. So we really use our standardized data sets, interpreted it through our fish sustainability index, and looking at that population size distribution and age class to determine when we have the ability and, and surplus to harvest and not, not to uh, impact um, the future populations. I think that's a generally, and, and that would go for any lake, not just sturgeon, sniper, slave, but many of the lakes in our province. And, and to your point, Adrian, there, uh, thank you for that, man. Yeah, I, I think that hits on a lot of the key key pieces of, of our assessment, how we use that information in evaluating options and looking at decisions. With respect to slave, understanding that it is such a big water body, uh, you know, compared to other lakes, looking at the complexity that we have for some of the depth stratum, uh, our monitoring in slave, we certainly look at it from the entire lake perspective, but we also uh, focus more of that uh, into paying attention within the lake, what are we seeing for trends and changes within like the littoral zone, that near shore environment? Uh, what are we seeing in some of the deeper water habitats? And then what are we seeing in the deepest water that's out there? So Slave uh, does present other pieces that, that we are sure when we talk about it at a lake level, there's oftentimes some nuance that we need to get to, uh, but we do pay attention to that when we are evaluating that data. So uh, when we see those rises, depending on where we see them, that's, as Adrian said, what can trigger us to come back to the table and uh, talk about different options. And no surprise, if for nothing else than just the size of Slave Lake, to see increases in abundance at that lake level, at a total population level, it is a lot of fish uh, that we need to see recruit into those populations. But each year that passes is a new year class that comes into the fishery. And so as we're able to hang on to some of those, and in the years when we see really strong recruits coming in, uh, we can see those pleasant increases. Thanks. Our next question comes from DJ. They're asking, which lakes is EPA going to stock walleye and when is it going to occur and how often? Hi, I can take that. Hey everybody, my name is Ryan Cox. I'm a fisheries biologist in Edson. Um, regarding walleye stocking, I can speak to the Northwest region. Um, um, as Miles had talked about in the presentation, we have to keep genetics in mind when selecting uh, a source population for walleye stocking. Now that we have that secured at Rock Island Lake, uh, we can proceed with stocking. Um, in the last few years, we've engaged stakeholders uh, as to where um, suitable water bodies would be for walleye stocking. And uh, um, within the Northwest region, we've selected Minnow Lake. Minnow Lake is a good uh, recipient water body as it has a long history of stocking. Uh, there's no um, inlets or outlets that are flowing to, uh, to have fish escape. And it is currently uh, seems to have a recruitment problem. So uh, the walleye that were stocked in there previously aren't self-sustaining. So this is a, a good candidate lake for, uh, for the walleye stocking program. 
regarding how many times are we going to be doing this. So the plan is for annual stocking, um, especially initially to, to establish a uh, population in there, and then we'll assess it as we go engaging stakeholders with uh, how, to, how to manage that. Um, as for other areas in the province, make sure you tune into other webinars uh, that are uh, talking about those and check out the Alberta fish stocking reports to, to, uh, to see how many walleye are stocked and where. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, we have two questions here about Slave Lake that we're going to group from Howard and Gaytan. Uh, the questions are, sorry, missed the lake assessment of Lesser Slave Lake. How has the slot uh, size introduction affected the fisher? Second question, last summer was caught more pike than we have in 20 years. Why is this? So that was actually two questions in one. And then the second question was, what's happening with Slave Lake and are we going to open the pike fishery this year? Well, first off, let me say uh, thanks so much, everybody, for asking questions about Lesser Slave Lake. Much appreciated for the love for uh, Slave and its watershed. Uh, thank you, Howard and Gaytan, for those questions in particular. Uh, so to the first question, which is how is the slot impacting the walleye population? Uh, that's a great question. And my answer would be, at this point, I don't know. Uh, we only, this this last summer, uh, so that the, the uh, 2022 fishing season will have been the first year that that regulation has been in place. Uh, we've heard feedback uh, through the course of the, the summer and fall from a bunch of different anglers on how their experience has gone. Some folks have had a really fa favorable summer. Other folks experienced difficulty. They were excited to catch uh, big fish, uh, but they were disappointed a little bit that they had to go back. Other folks uh, had different experiences. So again, owing to some of the size of Lesser Slave Lake, uh, it, it depending on where you're fishing from and what time of the year, your experience can be uh, very different from somebody else that's on the lake, knowing that at any one time there can be literally thousands of anglers on the lake. Um, what is the impact of that slot to the walleye population? We'll only know that when we complete the next assessment. So uh, the our generalized approach in fisheries management, once we have taken a management action, so we've implemented a new regulation intended to meet a desired objective, it is really critical for that to operate for a number of years so that we actually see what its consequence is in terms of the fish stock. There's two things that happen, how fish are being accessed in the fishery, as well as how fish are recruiting and moving through the population. That's the effect that we see. So uh, on most of our water bodies, our ability to see big changes year to year to year uh, can really depend on how big that water body is, how much pressure is there, what the population looked like when the regulation was applied. In a lake like Slave Lake, where it is really big, uh, we certainly need a few years uh, for any management change to operate for us to then be able to say, well, did we see the signal that we were hoping to see? So if that slot operates, we would expect to see that the abundance of fish either holds or gets better. We would expect to see the abundance of large fish either stay the same or get better. That's the intent is we want to have a narrow piece where people can take fish home for food, but then we also have the opportunity to retain those large uh, quality sized fish. So we understand what signal we're going to look for, and we expect that we'll be back to look at slave within a couple of years to see with sort of that leg, that time period for it to operate, did we see what we wanted to see from it? And so the second question there from Gaytan as well, it's the same principle with the pike uh, regulation. I don't have any intent at this point to uh, look at an opening for April 1, 2023. Uh, we don't have a fresh data set that would say we've seen a rise in pike uh, populations. Uh, I'm very pleased to hear that folks have had some positive pike fishing. Uh, kudos, great lure use, great positioning, great time of year. Uh, you know, we do get Again, a lot of reports from anglers across the lake uh, and across the year uh, that are variable. Some folks uh, had the opposite experience. And so we, we try to hang on to all that information and put it in context of those population surveys when we do them. So uh, when we have completed that assessment, you can guarantee that we'll be back in front of you to talk about those results, share our experiences, and talk about options. Thanks, Miles. Love seeing all the love for Slave Lake. Uh, the next question is coming from Mark. Is there a systematic program in place to remove culverts and other such barriers in grayling streams? If we see such a barrier, should we be reporting them? Thanks for the question, Mark. Yeah, so 
Uh, again, I'm Mike Blackburn, fisheries biologist out of Edson. Um, is there a systematic program? So there, there's a program for removal of culverts. Uh, it's actually uh, not within our shop. It's, uh, it's called the Water Course Crossing Program. Uh, there's, so what it is is basically working together with uh, different companies and such to get an idea of what kind of crossings are out there, where the barriers are, and then working on remediation plans uh, with, with, with the government, uh, with Alberta um, AER, which I can't tell you what AER is for right now. I don't know why, but so um, upstream oil and gas, uh, Alberta energy regulator. So what it is, is basically coming up with re remediation. So it's not just grayling streams, it's any barriers within tributaries. Um, specifically to uh, grayling streams though, what I could say in, in our backyard here in Edson is things like the Berlin River and the, um, the Wild Hay, which do have grayling in, are very, very high priorities in the province. I think they're number one and two for replacing uh, poor culverts and such. Um, the second part of your question here, oh, that there is an app that I know that they have with the uh, Water Course Crossing Program. If you go to their link, you could find it. They do have, so it, it's as simple as going on and carrying the app with you and identifying uh, crossings and such. So I, I believe they have it so that it, uh, other folks can do it as well as, as workers, but that would be a place to check there. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Mike. A question from a question from DJ here. Why is EPA not transferring walleye from Hag to Swan Lake? And what would the fishery be like today if this was done 15 to 20 years ago? Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself there. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, question. That is actually a, a question I do hear uh, from, from time to time. And we did look into um, that um, kind of a, a program uh, a couple of times. One of the reasons that it's it's not done is it's uh, quite uh, logistically uh, difficult and, and expensive to carry out uh, such a transfer. And uh, was particularly given the number of fish that would be required to uh, take out of Hague Lake and and put into uh, Sawn Lake. As you may be aware, both lakes were stocked um, around about the same the same time period, although Hag did get a couple more uh stocking so if uh perhaps on had been stocked um a little bit extra back then it may have uh it may show some of the same uh success that Hague Lake has had uh although there could be uh, other factors um at play in our, our last survey we did actually find a uh, a fairly good proportion of uh young fish in Sawn Lake, which was uh, something quite nice to see. So it could be that the, the fish are doing that on their own and we uh, may not even need to, to worry about this uh, in the future. And we should know that uh, next time it's sampled in uh, about two years from now, so. Thanks, Chris. Okay, we have uh, two questions here that I'm gonna group. Uh, John's asking, are there target dates for re-establishing harvest opportunities for native sport fish in lakes found in the vicinity of Peerless, Aquisium, Goodfish, and Vandersteer? Vandersteer, you're gonna have to excuse my pronunciation on that yeah. one. Thank you, Chris. And then uh, Teko Tika was wondering about how is Peerless Lake fishery being monitored? I see we've Chris, gone you're from- take that yeah, I see we've gone from love for uh, Lesser Slave Lake to love for the Peerless Lakes area. Sharing um, the love. Yeah, good, <laughs> good question. Um, so uh, there are uh, currently, I mean, again, all of those lakes are on uh, catch, uh, catch and release uh, for conservation purposes. Um, they uh, will be are sort of scheduled for reassessment here in the next uh, year or two. And again, based on those results, we can look at uh, whether we can reopen them uh to to fishing um i see and then uh same for peerless lake peerless lake is a bit um requires a bit of a little bit extra effort because it does contain um a lake trail population which requires a monitoring technique uh different from the other two species that we've uh, pretty much been talking about um all night here the pike and the walleye and that monitoring program is because of the um longevity of, of the lake trout is is kind of on a 10 year um 
time frame and which would kind of put it up on uh, on this year or even next year as um, as likely. So we uh, do kind of uh, monitor things like you know get reports from from anglers and from the officers up there uh, to sort of see. And I mean, it is obviously a little bit anecdotal, but uh, all accounts uh, point to uh, some certainly some good success in and peerless for for the lake trout um not so much for for the walleye and pike but uh those will uh continue to be monitored great okay another question from dj here why would you look at strawberry creek uh, excuse me why would you look at strawberry creek when you have the south heart river to pull from guessing that's in relation to the stocking miles it is, and and wrestling the title back from Chris there about more love for Lesser Slave Lake, um, and you know so before I uh, great question DJ um, before I, I, I leap right into that what I should have said earlier too is because there is lots of uh, questions and folks obviously thinking about slave uh, on our uh, the environment and protected areas uh, YouTube channel there are two webinars from last year where we talked about uh, slave lake in particular one was kind of an information session leading up to the regulation change. And the other was a similar session to this, uh, where we talked about the different options. Uh, there's also some materials on uh, My Weld Alberta. So if you're looking for additional materials for Slave, um, if you uh, hop online there, there are some videos and reports and things you can read to, to present more information than I can share right here. Uh, with respect to your question, DJ, which is a great question. Uh, so the South Heart River for folks that are um, aware for Lesser Slave Lake performs an incredibly valuable function for the spawning habitat for walleye in the lake. Uh, transmitter work and historical studies uh, from the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s have shown us that you know, walleye that may spend most of their time resident in the East Basin near Devonshire will actually travel the length of the lake going up that South Heart system to spawn uh, in the early spring and then uh, making the long swim back to the East Basin. So its utility for walleye spawning cannot be understated. We, the department has run several spawn camps on that channel in the past. Uh, why we didn't look at it this time was uh, we also have had some learnings from that system. Uh, it does have challenges with water quality, so it can be quite turbid. Uh, it's very difficult to control for that. So in the past, they've had to have like different sluice tanks that were there to allow the water to settle out before being used in the containers where we would put the fertilized uh, eggs uh, or else it can result in, in um, higher than uh, what we could accept mortality on those eggs. Uh, there's been challenges with temperature. So similarly, we've had to set up infrastructure to deal with water temperature. Uh, the river where the walleye typically kind of come through that we've uh, traditionally intercepted them is quite wide. So depending on the, the lake level and flood state, uh, it's very people and gear intensive to set up there. There's floating docks and tents and a lot of different things. So uh, our goal was to see if we could find other places in the upper Athabasca watershed where we could be a little bit more flexible and nimble. Uh, Rock Islands presented us that opportunity where we still have uh, reasonable numbers of mature uh, large females and male walleye. Uh, the water quality isn't something that we are going to fight with like we would in the South Heart. Uh, lakes are a little bit more polite to work on than flowing water systems for keeping the uh, traps and the, the means by which we can collect and hold those fish in place. Uh, and we don't have the same constraint that, that we saw historically at the South Heart for water temperature. So um, much love to the South Heart River. And I can't understate how important it is for the functions it provides for the walleye population in Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, for our efforts in terms of developing source stocks for walleye stocking, uh, we are looking in a few other places and, and we'll see how Rock Island pans out for us. All signs point to it probably will be a positive uh, source, um, but we always have it in our back pocket. So if we needed to go back there, we also have a good blueprint uh, for how it works and what we would need to make it work. Thanks, Miles. Mm -hmm. Question from Frank. Has there been a recent population assessment for Arctic grayling and bull trout in the Little Smoky River? Great question, Frank. I'll take this one. Yes, there has. Uh, the last assessment was in 2021. And similar to how I presented the muskeg, we did a two component standardized watershed level assessment for the upper Little Smoky region, essentially Fox Creek and up to the headwaters. 
We typically would see bull trout isolated in the headwaters of that watershed and then rainbow, or sorry, rainbow, Arctic railing uh, dispersing all the way down, if you're familiar, just past Tony Creek. It was an interesting year, 2021. We've had a couple of big heat domes in the last couple of years, and that seemed to impact some of our data sets. And um, just speaking anecdotally to my experience fishing in that river, both surveys, one in 2016, and then one in 2021, the same river, same sections that I fished, dramatically less water. Fish were not located anywhere near where they were in the years previous. So we did see a drop in, in densities. We'll have to follow it up with another year's worth of monitoring here in the next year or two to determine if there's an actual trend or if it was a signal of the heat dome and those fish had dispersed, dispersed to cold water refugia or they moved further upstream. But thanks for your question, Frank. We have a question from Paul, and I'm going to group it with a few other questions here as well. Uh, Paul's question is, I'd like to hear about a recovery plan for Graham Lake. Why not an egg collection to re rear fingerlings and restock back to the lake? And I think we might be able to answer that with uh, two questions from Tika, one that had actually been pre-submitted. So thank you so much for the questions. Uh, what's the recovery plan for Red Earth area lakes? And are there any active recovery initiatives beyond CNR planned, stocking or cormorants? And will the no harvest regulation be enough to recover the Red Earth fisheries? Any surveys done this year in the area? Well, uh, thanks, Paul and Tika, for uh, the questions. I'll try and kind of maybe group all the answers together as best I can. Uh, as far as uh, Graham or uh, known as also known as Trout Lake, uh, there is, um, as uh, Miles Brown uh, was uh, discussing a little bit in the uh, during the presentation itself, uh, the collection of of walleye eggs is just kind of uh, getting going again. Uh, sort of. In this case, to conserve the genetics, it would, as you say, have to be a uh, sort of a lakeside um, uh, program. Um, currently, that's um, not really uh, in in the cards uh, so much for that. Um, again, quite a little bit more logistically difficult. We have to make sure that all of the um, material that you know it's the same genetic material going back. The our native walleye in the lake, so we couldn't just pull. Um, eggs from uh, another source. Um, although uh, we did find in the last um, uh, the last survey a, a rather uh, large number of uh, juvenile fish were, were present in the lake. The uh, looking back at the historical data, the, the lake has had uh, sort of a long history of, of sort of what we'd call spotty recruitment. Um, it's not consistent every year, but about every five or uh, so usually about five to seven years, there's a very large uh, increase in the number of uh, um, eggs laid and, and subsequently, uh, you know, large young fish. And then you see that uh, sort of pulse of fish carry on through um, through time. Um, in uh, 2000, and the last time I was sampled in 2017, uh, it had been about 17 years. So since that uh, pulse had occurred, which uh, was leading to a population decline and an over, and thus the implementation of the, the catch and release regulation. Like I said, in uh, last year, in 2021, uh, sorry, not last year, two years ago, 2021, the uh, it was found that, again, the large number of, of Young fish likely mean that the uh, the lake is is on sort of its own uh, recovery, and once those fish have uh, have gotten to a size where they're successfully reproducing, uh, we should then be able to have some options to to open that up. Um, so yeah, so related to Tika's question there, um, beyond uh, catch and release uh, regulations, uh, would there be no no stocking again? Those are all native. Um, species so we just can't bring eggs in uh from wherever uh the cormorant program is being evaluated in the the northeast and uh there might be someone here who can speak to that a little bit better but once we know the uh have some results from that and if it does show that cormorant control is having uh positive effects on, on the fisheries then that is something we could potentially implement in the uh the peerless lake uh area as there have been reports of, of large numbers of those um 
uh, in uh, on Graham Lake in, in particular. And sort of the last uh, kind of part is uh, any surveys to be done this year. Uh, we are currently in, uh, well, early stages of our, of our field planning. Uh, some of those lakes are, would be on our normal sort of rotation schedule uh, for the year. Um, but again, it will uh, kind of boil down to uh, the staff and other uh, commitments, whether they make it on this year. And if not this year, it will definitely be uh, next year. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. You did a great job with the oh. multiple questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hopefully I didn't bounce around too much, folks. So that's great. Thanks. Uh, I have two questions that have come up here that are outside of our region, but I did want to read them out. Uh, Ron was asking, have any assessments been done on the pike and walleye populations on Calling Lake? If so, when were they done and what did they reveal? And then any updates on Wobdman Lake? Yeah, I was just going to jump in here quickly, Natalie, and uh, thank Ron and Randy for the questions. Uh, it's also good to, to hear and see, well, see kind of virtually some familiar faces. So um, hi to both of those gentlemen. Uh, so both lakes do fall out of the region. Um, Ron and Randy out of here. So uh, the biologists today that we're presenting, those lakes don't fall within their management areas. But um, what I'd encourage folks to do that might not, you know, for if we're uh, providing feedback where those water bodies aren't necessarily in that northwest management area. Um, one of the easiest things to do in terms of at least finding out quickly if there's been recent assessments done is just by googling Alberta fall index netting. So uh, both uh, Adrian and, and Miles presented a little bit on smoke in Fawcett Lake, uh, which uses the fall index netting as a standardized protocol for, for our lakes. Uh, it's certainly our most common and, uh, and consistently used methodology. So um, I'm going to break eye contact with you, Natalie, just a little bit, but I am going to let um, uh, Ron and Randy know that uh, looking back through, it looks like Wabaman was last uh, assessed using fall index netting in 2020. So that that small uh, that small report can be found by by again googling uh, fall index netting uh, Alberta. By the looks of it. Um, uh, Randy, in this case, the assessment showed that uh, at the time 2020. Yeah, 2020, that uh, walleye populations were at low risk, uh, pike populations were at high risk, very high risk. Uh, and then Ron, it looks like I go back to about 2017 to the last time that we did uh, a fall index netting um, assessment on Calling Lake. So again, that report would be there to go back to. And uh, for, I guess, back in 2017, Ron, it was showing walleye populations to be low to moderate risk. Uh, and pike to be at high to very high risk. So um, if, either of you, if either of you gentlemen want to just uh, contact me offline, uh, I can certainly put you in contact with the folks that would have more details on both of those water bodies. So I uh, hope that was helpful for tonight. So, Thanks, Kadon. Thanks for providing that extra information about where the information can be found. And then I did see that Catherine was able to uh, share the links. And if people did want more information, we'll be having some upcoming webinars. We'll share that information again at the end, but you can register for those webinars as well by going to our engagement page. And I bet Catherine will share that with you. So our next question here is coming from Clarence. They're wondering, is enforcement finding any changes to illegal harvest in lakes and streams in the area? To my question, I see licensed sales are much lower in the last two years. Hi, Clarence, thanks for the question. <laughs> in regards to enforcement, uh, over the last few years, uh, the types, of, types and amounts of violations that we've been encountering has uh, remained fairly consistent. Uh, that being said, between the High Prairie and Slave Lake districts, we've been operating at approximately 50% manpower. Uh, good news, uh, we were able to uh, fill the High Prairie districts, so we're at 100% right now. And uh, we're also running a, an academy uh, in May, so uh, our intent is to have the Slave Lake district uh, backed up to 100% uh, with the officers uh, by September. Again, like, like, like uh, I mentioned every year, we, we depend very heavily on the public uh, when it's in the right direction, uh, we see uh, resource abuse. Uh, so folks are able to call the reporting poacher line at 1-800-642-3800. Uh, that's essentially our central dispatch. And uh, you'll be 
an officer will be in touch and uh, you can provide your information to that officer. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, the next question here is coming from Carl. You assess the Muskeg River watershed and have collected population data for future studies on native trout. Were you able to compare it with any previous population assessments or are they really comparable based on previous studies? What is the FSI score for bull trout in the Muskeg watershed? Yeah, thanks Carl, great question. Um, this was the first watershed level assessment done under the, the standards in which we employ for the Native Trout Recovery Program. However, there's been previous ACA studies and I am currently going through that data to determine uh, and analyze it in, in, in a manner as if it was collected in the standards. There's enough sampling points across the watershed. That work is still in progress. Uh, that's going to feed into our trend analyses over time. In terms of bull trout right now, they hover in that high risk, very high risk category, very high risk in terms of juveniles, high risk in terms of adults. Not too surprising, similar story for bull trout across the province. Thanks, Adrian. We have a question here from Taylor. What is being done to determine the reason why walleye populations are declining in Alberta? Is it angling pressure, lack of spawning habitat, poor recruitment, predation? I understand each lake is different, but how are you exploring this? I'll, uh, I'll Thanks, take a Miles. swing at that, Natalie. And, and of course, I invite any of my uh, other colleagues on the panel here to chime in. But uh, that is a really great question uh, and certainly a complex question. So the first piece that I might say is, uh, and, and Kate and others have alluded to this, uh, since about the year 2000, we've been using uh, across the province a standardized assessment method that allows us to get snapshots, cross sections of walleye populations. That uh, particularly on water body is done through time, get, allows us to get a sense of trend, age classes, size classes, recruitment. Uh, so I would say that if we were thinking about walleye populations in Alberta, if we bend that by certain decades, time periods in the past when we had very different regulatory regimes, wasn't all that long ago where uh, a common regulation was 10 fish, no size. Uh, from those days to now, I think we've actually seen improvements in walleye uh, across the province uh, by and large. So the time scale that we would think about that question on matters. Uh, in the last like uh, several decades, we've seen things like walleye restorations in Lac La Biche. Uh, we've seen improvements in certain uh, water bodies that have seen declines through time. Uh, as we then get into that, as, as you kind of alluded to, lake by lake, there can be environmental characteristics, what's happening in terms of like watersheds for water levels. Uh, there is a human dimension to this for sure that uh, we know that anglers in Alberta are very mobile, they'll move around quite a bit. There's lots of things that can influence that on a year to year basis. Uh, we saw one of them during the recent pandemic years where that had a noticeable increase in a lot of fishing effort in Alberta. Uh, some folks couldn't go other places. Some folks had not done fishing, but they were here and began to exercise that as a great recreational opportunity. A program we have in place right now that has looked at that in certain water bodies uh, has been evaluating the functionality of things like harvest lots, where we are monitoring fishing pressure and effort at different lakes. We are looking at the population structure with that netting tool, uh, and we're collecting information from anglers about their experience. So um, how do we do this? We have a couple key surveys in our toolbox that we look at uh, anglers through things like creels, populations through our index netting, uh, surveys with anglers for their experience. Uh, and depending on what we see at a lake level, Chris kind of alluded to this in like a Graham Lake, there was a question earlier, uh, hey, it looks like there's a recruitment challenge here. What's causing that? That might be a very particular uh, assessment to go, why do we have a recruitment problem here? Um, other lakes might be, there are no walleye that were present there. We've been able to use stocking to create one of those kind of put, grow, take harvest opportunities. And if that fishery isn't self-sustaining, we're able to top it up with stocking through time. Uh, other systems like Lesser Slave Lake uh, in and of itself, uh, I have heard stories from folks when they, either if they grew up here, they came here in the late 70s and early 1980s, walleye were very rare at that time period. They had gone through several decades of decline uh, and it was management actions like uh, protecting spawning habitats in the South Hart River and other key water body areas, 
uh, different regulation choices and management choices for different types of fisheries that over a, a 10 to 15 year period enabled walleye to come back to the point that by the mid 90s, they were again a fish people regularly caught. So um, I hope that gives you a sense of how we can do that in those different scales. Time matters, where matters. Uh, certain lakes will have their own challenges where those lakes are in the province. Uh, and then the species uh, certainly presents on a case by case basis some things that we do look at. Thanks, Miles. We have another question here, a little bit different about uh, genetics uh, from Clarence. And they were wondering why we insist on that genetic purity when we're looking at fish populations and comparing this to uh, cattle or wildlife um, that show improvement when there are new populations mixing together. Uh, great question. Uh, Mike Blackburn here again from uh, Edson. Uh, I'm going to uh, look at this one specifically, I guess, tailored around Athabasca rainbow trout, uh, just to try to keep it clear in my mind, since I'm not a geneticist, and hopefully this helps you out. Uh, so with regards to things like, say, the Athabasca rainbow trout, uh, some of the criteria in, in its designation uh, stipulate what kind of purity we're looking for to maintain these species or for recovery purposes. Uh, also, when it comes to things like, uh, so specifically for Athabasca rainbow trout, uh, we find that uh, the pure fish tend to be kind of in the headwaters. Uh, they, they seem to be well adapted to these cool streams. And we're even seeing that some of the, the, the hatchery fish that are in the system that we have stocked throughout the past and, um, and, and, and even more recently, don't even tend to hybridize with some of these, these pure fish in these streams in absence of barriers. So there's potentially an adaptation there in the pure fish uh, for the small cool streams in the, in the headwater streams. So we don't really want to, those, those genetics aren't watering down right now through hybridization uh, in some of the streams. So we don't wanna mess with that either. Uh, so specifically for rainbows, uh, that's, that's why we're looking at it right now. Thanks, Mike. Very interesting stuff there. Uh, this question from Randy is asking about Haas Lake, uh, that there has been some really positive improvements from the partnership between ACA and EPA and some stakeholder groups and how the lake can be brought back. Uh, and I don't know if um, you might be able to actually speak to this program for some of us who might not be familiar with that program, uh, but then goes on to ask if there might be any other projects in the future, uh, looking at such a model, uh, Sandy Lake by Alexander would be a good example, Alexander Reserve, I should say, and a great perch fishery years ago. Let's bring it back. Um, that's, uh, that's a great example, Randy. Um, one I, I don't know all the details on, but and you know I wanted to maybe just speak a little bit, Natalie and, and Randy, maybe to that aspect of, yeah, we, we are seeking or do seek those opportunities out here. And Miles, I, I'm, I'm gonna drag you into this conversation a little bit with me here as well. And um, from a bit of a Northwest kind of centric lens, Randy, like they're, you know, over the last few years, you know, we do have some examples where, uh, Miles can speak to this a little bit more, where we've looked to establish fisheries in partnership with organizations like that. One, maybe Miles, I'll get you to provide just a little bit more detail on is uh, the establishment of a perch fishery uh, on Mitsu Lake. So just east of Slave Lake and Miles, your work with the, uh, the local fish and game uh, association that's been, you know, partnered in doing, doing that with us. And I think Randy, in, in some some of these that might not be as high profile, maybe as Hassey Lake, where, again, that aspect to evaluating where can we find even uh, new non-native trout stocking opportunities. We certainly work with uh, the Alberta Conservation Association is probably one of our closest partners maybe here in the Northwest as we seek, I'm going to call it new new angling and new fishing opportunities. Uh, the valuation of water bodies that either had fish um, at one point in time and don't. Um, we're looking at those in in different ways and, and 
and seeking to see if there's maybe suitability that exists now, or even technology like lake aeration uh, that might not have been in there, let's say, uh, you know, 20, 25, 30 years ago when we last assessed that. And then, of course, part of that is, is uh, you know, those aspects where, you know, have we had winter kill or have we lost uh, a fishery in the past? And is there a means to restore that fishery? And, and if not in a sustainable matter uh, or manner, maybe there's an opportunity for, um, I'm going to call it more like a liberal harvest fishery where they're stocked and and with the expectation that it's going to require restocking or retransferring um, with a, you know, probably with a harvest in mind, because we would look to uh, reestablish that on an annual or, or, or a periodic basis like that. So, Miles, I might just let you jump in here too. Uh, the Mitsu Lake one was a good example, maybe recently in your area where, you know, we are striving to provide new angling and more diverse angling opportunities for uh, folks in the Northwest here. So, Yeah, thanks, Kadon. So, uh, the... The lake Kadon mentioned. So there is a lake just uh, to the immediate east of Lesser Slave Lake called Mitsu. Um, I and many of my peers here in Slave Lake have had conversations with folks like uh, past presidents and current members and presidents of the Slave Lake Rod and Gun Club, uh, other really passionate outdoors folks, uh, members of the Saw Ridge First Nation, who have said, hey, are we, is there opportunity for us to restore the diversity of fish present in Mitsu Lake with a focus in that discussion on perch. Um, owing to the conversation that we were just having that Mike talked about with uh, importance around certain the genetic pieces, and we've focused on that even with the walleye uh, in previous answers, we looked at a donor location within the slave watershed uh, where perch were and weren't performing in a manner that was providing a great uh, perch fishing opportunity. They were within the watershed of Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, so we are still in the middle of an experimental sort of trial to see, uh, can we effectively transplant, transfer, not culture, but uh, move fish from that location into Mitsu Lake, uh, which is a relatively large water body, has uh, strong populations of gamers, freshwater shrimp, where we know there's good food, uh, their spawning habitat and opportunity, and they've been there in the past. Uh, so we have had three successive years in the summer of moving uh, volumes of fish in there with the target of uh, essentially transferring fish in at, at an abundance of uh, one fish per hectare in that water body. Um, for folks that had the chance uh, or would like to, I, I would recommend looking at the provincial uh, presentation here from last week. They got into some specifics around uh, kind of perch population dynamics that I won't dive into here, but we understand our goal in moving those fish in as well as about retention. So uh, they are coming into that system, you know, age uh, one to four. So, you know, lengths around uh, nine to kind of 14 centimeters. Uh, and to get to that point where they provide that desirable fishing opportunity, half pound, one pound, pound and a half, uh, we know we have to hang on to those fish so that they are in that six to 10 years of age. Uh, type piece. That is a size of fish that when we go back and assess Mitsu Lake, we hope to see those adults present in the lake that'll tell us, hey, we were moving sufficient quantities that they were able to uh, gain critical mass and uh, ideally we'll see recruitment coming in uh, and we will see uh, those adults uh, that we, we know we put in there uh, grow through time. Uh, if that's favorable, we'll be able to come back to the public and report on that and say, hey, this, is, this was the mechanics of our uh, project. And as Kadon had said, we look for those opportunities in different places. Um, also, uh, you know, appreciating that we don't want to um, spend that effort or those fish in places where the outcome could be questionable. So we had all the right characteristics in Mitsu Lake to uh, give this a whirl. And uh, we, we, I, to your point, Kadon, we actually also tried this uh, at the behest of folks who on the west side of the lake uh, had fished Blue Lake many years ago. Uh, Blue Lake has been stocked at times in the past with rainbow trout. Uh, it has challenges with oxygen levels that make it difficult for trout to survive in, but are at the level where we expect um, perch a little bit hardier in terms of what they can sustain for temperature and oxygen thresholds uh, could make a run in there. So we have uh, also paralleled this in Blue Lake and uh, look forward to seeing if we if we meet our targets and objectives. Thanks, Miles. And, you know, I just saw an interesting question come in, more of a comment. Just it'd be so nice if uh, you all could identify yourselves. And, you know, it wouldn't be too late to start. So, Miles, Kadon, would you mind just stepping back and reminding the people who you are in case they've missed it at the beginning? Sure. Miles, why don't you go first? Uh, my name is Miles Brown. I'm the senior fisheries uh, biologist here in Slave Lake. 
And and thanks, Natalie, for that reminder. Like bat on, shame on me. Uh, Kate Owen Wilcox, Regional Fisheries Manager here for the Northwest. Thank you. Uh, okay, so next question here. We can we can get in a couple more before we wrap up. Uh, Wayne was wondering when is Snipe Lake going to be looked at again for pike? Good question, Wayne. And this is Adrian Manka, Senior Fisheries Biologist out of Grand Prairie. Yeah, it's on my work plan for this coming season. So cross my fingers. I'm really interested to get in there. Uh, one to to look at what the story's going on with uh, one pike as it is catch and release walleye. We're starting to see a, a remarkable recovery in a fishery. And then just checking in on the whitefish uh, with this past fish kill. And snipe is a very popular winter whitefish fishery. So uh, back to the answer to your question, hopefully this fall. Thank you. Now we have two questions here about walleye stocking. Tika was wondering, why is the walleye genetics concern so restrictive compared to most other North American jurisdictions? And then DJ had a question here. If the walleye are not able to sustain themselves in a water body after stocking, has EPA completed a habitat assessment? And if not, why? Yeah, so I was going to maybe try to jump in here uh, on it, Natalie. I'm going to look to my my peers and colleagues here to kind of jump in and and keep me correct. So it's Kate on here again, uh, Natalie. So thanks, Tika and and DJ for the two questions. I think they're close. Uh, we'll try to grab them both here together. Um, you know, I, I don't want to repeat Mike what you provided on the Athabasca Rainbow uh, Trout piece, but there are a little a lot of similarities. Miles, you kind of spoke to this in the last answer regarding our considerations in yellow perch transfers, and and all of those kind of go part and parcel together. And I, I think the piece that Mike you talked about uh, and Tika how it applies here is is I think you know over time what we found and we're constantly learning, uh, we're constantly taking the information that we we get. We're working with um, you know other organizations, we're working with uh, researchers, uh, with academia, you know, and I think the one thing that really comes out is is those aspects of native genetics are still best suited for that environment. So uh, like within watershed, what we're finding is the success uh, in terms of stocking or transfers uh, is we, we have the evidence to show that that's still they, those those fish or those genetics are still the best equipped to, pr to provide um, both performance. So that's the, the uh, becoming suitable to their background, their growth, their density, their resilience to things like disease, um, to to viral, to uh, all those kinds of aspects that uh, those native species would have built resilience to over the last number of years, and that's reflected in their genetics. Um, I, I can't speak to all different jurisdictions, uh, Tika and others, like I say, my colleagues can jump in here. I think it, there's been a, a, a higher growing uh, acknowledgement of that uh, going forward. And I think I'm seeing more and more jurisdictions that are considering, you know, that in when they're talking about stocking or where they're talking about introducing uh, new species or restorative stocking, those kinds of pieces going forward and more and more uh, hand in hand um, partnership with with academics with researchers going for that and, and as jurisdictions coming together the one thing i might say you know going back in my experience too is as we get into the more southern aspects of range let's say walleye for example um the one thing that alberta has to consider is our investment in that and i think uh, folks talked earlier today about how long it takes to grow walleye in in alberta and and so we're talking about investments of 10 years before walleye start to actually reproduce and then we look to see how successful that is that can be another 10 years and so what we've often seen is you know multiple decades to get to where we actually have a self-sustaining walleye population. As we, uh, as I talk to my colleagues in Texas, they talk about how uh, their female walleye sp are spawning at age two. Um, so the investment is much less. Um, uh, the consideration of that, I think, is still a, a key in terms of that genetic aspect. But because that investment is lower, uh, how they can start reproducing and, and uh, establishing fisheries is quicker. Uh, you know, I think that becomes a conversation, that trade off of genetic considerations um, going forward. They can reestablish a fishery in, in a fifth of the time uh, often that we can do in, in Alberta. So um, I, I'm going to just seek to my colleagues here if I missed anything in regards to at least Tika's first part of that question. Then uh, we do want to address DJ. So. The only thing I might uh, add on to that, Kate, on is, you know, even within Alberta, 
uh, when we have that consideration in this conversation about genetics, uh, we do look at also, you know, where are we working? What, uh, what water bodies are these things going into? Uh, if we're looking at stocking, uh, particularly in some of the reservoirs or impounded systems that are in Southern Alberta, the uh, degree to which we need to focus on that genetic piece may not be as high where, you know, up here, we're in the Eastern slopes, the boreal systems, escapement is more of a potential risk, depending on flood states. These are still, you know, natural river and lake type systems compared to some of the other ones in different places and other jurisdictions. Saskatchewan as an example would share some of that where some of their more popular fisheries that are discussed as lakes are in point of fact reservoirs. So uh, what that risk profile is compared, you know, where you're doing it uh, can shift. It shifts within Alberta uh, and, and it may even shift just depending on what objectives we have in neighboring water bodies around there. So um, I, I think it's a continuum, uh, you know, in, in stealing words from Kate, uh, Kate on there. Yeah, that's a great addition, Miles. Thanks. Um, and that's what we're seeing even from uh, folks that are aware of our current stocking initiatives that where we're using Lac St. Anne as a base for walleye stocking, uh, raising those eggs from a North Saskatchewan River drainage population, and they're going into South Saskatchewan River uh, water bodies in those reservoirs, as you've mentioned, Miles, that, that, that consequence of that trade-off uh, is, is much less in regards to, you know, the risks that we think about before we put, you know, uh, certain fish in certain locations. So uh, switching over to DJs a little bit here. So uh, Natalie, uh, so it's Kate on here again. Uh, if the walleye are not able to sustain themselves in a water body after stocking, has EPA completed a habitat assessment? And if no, and if not, why not? Um, Miles, I'm just going to, you know, uh, take your words too, which was on the yellow perch transfer, how important it was for us to, to look at that habitat component and confirm that, again, that investment of time, uh, the likelihood or probability of success was going to be much higher by looking at the habitat of the receiving body and understanding if it was going to be successful. Um, I think going back, DJ, and again, others will have some other experiences. You know, we have done that. I, I, um, Miles, I think of Wenogamy Lake. Uh, where we've had sporadic, uh, irregular recruitment, sometimes what I would refer to as recruitment failures on those aspects. And, and we've then looked back again and said, after our initial habitat assessment, you know, we're still having challenges uh, for, for uh, regular recruitment. We've tried enhancements in, those, in some of those places, DJ, as a result of that. That's been mixed success, I think, is how we'd probably characterize that. Uh, going in, I think we, you know, we understand that there is uncertainty, uh, sometimes with those habitat pieces. Um, uh, you know, but ultimately, uh, that habitat component is something we really think about on the front end uh, and make that investment worthwhile. So again, I'll back out, see if others have anything to offer uh, before we do there. So thanks, DJ. The only little piece I might add uh, onto that, Kedon, because I think you hit the nail on the head perfectly there is, is uh, I'd almost pull that into like a concluder of uh, there are no silver bullets. Uh, they are very rare in, when we are doing these things. So we know these tools can work. Uh, the habitat assessments at Wanogamy are a great example where there was lots of great work done, uh, conclusions drawn that that were defensible and uh, you know intelligent were completed on the backside of that. And yet still there is that uh, uncertainty and variability in nature that has meant we've continued to see some of those pieces still of uh, years where we have recruitment failures, inconsistent recruitment, um, and some of those things play through. So uh, we can take all the steps, but sometimes still encounter that that concern or that issue. Thanks, guys. I feel like we could talk about that for a while longer, but uh, and Natalie, I, I will a... suggest anyone can follow up with any of us on these questions because you're right. We could yeah. have lots of conversations. Yeah. So I'll just uh, try to sneak in one more question here uh, from Mike. With respect to Windfall Creek, he had seen some Alberta scientists a couple of years ago when he was fishing. Is there a study underway on uh, grayling and trout populations there? Hey, I'll take that one, Natalie. <clears throat> Thanks for the question, Mike. Uh, again, I'm Ryan Cox, fisheries bio out of Edson. Uh, there's been lots of love for the Slave Lake and Peace areas here, so nice to uh, speak to the Edson and Whitecourt area. The short answer is uh, no, nothing specific for the Windfall Creek uh, is coming up in the immediate future. Um, but as Adrian and others have, have mentioned here tonight, we do try to uh, do some rotational monitoring on all of our important watersheds. 
<clears throat> that said, um, we do plan to do some work in the windfall area on the the Athabasca River itself. Um, probably, if not this fall, then then in the next uh, the next um, that would be uh, jet boat electro fishing, capturing all all fish that we encounter, measuring them, and then letting them go back into the uh, the watercourse. Thanks for the question. Okay, I'm going to sneak in one more question here. Uh, during zero harvest regulations for pike and or walleye in a water body, are other species monitored for population impact, such as perch and whitefish? Uh, uh, thanks, Rob. Chris Briggs here, uh, Senior Biologist in uh, Peace River. Uh, and I guess the short answer to that is, is yes, we do uh, capture all those species uh, as part of the um, Fall index netting uh, in those, although we don't have uh, set um, thresholds uh, for the populations of those, we do we do monitor uh, changes uh, over time. So, and I do actually have one uh, sort of unrelated uh, question. We did hear one of the things we heard quite a bit is uh, when are you going to be sampling such and such a lake? And I would uh, remind folks online that we actually have uh, several hiring opportunities uh, for the Northwest region if. Uh, you, what you've seen tonight makes you uh, yearn for a career in fisheries. Um, head on over to the, <laughs> uh, thank you, Miles. Head on over to uh, the Alberta.ca uh, site and uh, search for jobs. So, Thanks, Chris. Okay, I'll just wrap up here uh, with a few quick reminders before we say goodnight. Uh, we want to hear from you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for the questions. If you would like to head over and keep on sharing your opinions on the survey for sport fishing regulations at Cold Lake this year, um, that closes February 9th. You can use the QR code on your screen or Catherine will be putting it in the Q uh, chat box there. There's also a tool on that web page called Ask the Expert. So if you didn't have your questions answered tonight or if you have more questions, please do put them into the Ask the Expert, and we will try to address them as quickly as we can. There's also uh, registration information and fact sheets about all of the webinars we've had and that are upcoming there on that page. Speaking of upcoming webinars, January 31st for the South region. So there was some questions about Wobdomin Lake, for example, please tune in there and native trout recovery. If you'd like to chat in person, if you want to continue these conversations, please see us at some of the upcoming uh, outdoor shows. There's the Calgary Boat Show, uh, Calgary Outdoor and Adventure Show, and the Edmonton Boat and Sportsman Show coming up over the next few months. We'll see you there. And share your love uh, with someone who maybe doesn't have a sport fishing license yet on family fishing weekend. So February 18th to 20th, anyone without a sport fishing regulation is still welcome to fish. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to take out a friend or family member who is new to fishing, but of course, uh, sport fishing regulations still apply, just no license required. If you're not already following us on Facebook, please do at My Wild Alberta. Lots of great fishy content there, as well as the My Wild Alberta webpage. It was mentioned a few times this evening, a wealth of information for all kinds of uh, fish related uh, and fisheries management questions. As you, I hope, uh, have the impression, we do really like to hear from you. There's one survey just about the webinar in particular that'll be prompted onto your screen as you close out of tonight's meeting. And we would love if you could take a minute and just let us know how we did tonight and if you have any feedback for improvement for future webinars. So all of that said, thank you all so much for being here and sharing your evening with us. We hope that you found it informative. We hope that you found the passion for fisheries contagious, and uh, maybe we'll see you out on the rivers and lakes this summer. Thanks so much, everyone.